Hello, everyone. My name is Sheridan Moore. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to Chris. That was awesome. That was great. So I work at Esri. I'm an imaging and remote sensing scientist. That's the team that I work on. And Esri is the global market leader in geographic information system software. That's why Chris was bringing up why we need all of that information. Uh, we also focus on location intelligence, so really bringing all of this information to the public, and of course mapping, because cartography, right? So Esri turns science to action so that governments and organizations all over can maximize their impact for people, place, and planet. And that's really what we want to talk about today. So what we're going to discuss is the interconnection between satellite imagery, land cover, and biodiversity. First thing I want to do is just take a little bit of time to in have our panelists introduce themselves. Dr. Steve Brumby. Hi, I'm Steve Brumby. Uh, I lead a small tech company called Impact Observatory. Um, I'm an, I am a scientist entrepreneur, and my specialty is artificial intelligence applied to Earth observation satellite imagery. Hi everyone, I'm Sue Natale. I'm a scientist and Arctic program director at the Woodwell Climate Research Center and I'm interested in understanding how climate change is impacting um, ecosystems and the north and what that means for everyone on the planet. Hi everybody, can you hear me all right? Great. Um, I am Alex Killian, I'm a conservation scientist who uses satellite imagery to understand how species are distributed around the world. And I work with the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, and I also direct the Center for Biodiversity and Global Change at Yale University. We're gonna be asking our panelists three big questions, and I'm excited to hear what they're all gonna say. So the first one is, what are you working on now in relation to climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency? Steve, you're the first one. Take it away. Thanks. So, okay, so what we're looking at here at, uh, in the picture is um, actually the most up-to-date map of the Austin area. Um, so our basic way of understanding the world is through maps. We've been making maps for a very long time, hundreds and hundreds of years. We've been making high-accuracy maps. And one of the things that I think we all realize today with the, with the joint crises of climate, biodiversity, and, and sustainability is that you have to have up-to-date maps if you're going to make good decisions, and those maps need to keep up with the way the world is changing. So one thing people may be not so happy to hear is that even in the United States, we have the world's most advanced national program for mapping our country, um, and the most recent official map of the United States dates from 2019. And this is March 2023. And later this year, there will be an update expected that will update the official map of the US to 2021. And I think we all have the sense that that is far too slow and too delayed if you're going to be a decision maker in governments or in industry or in markets or in NGOs and conservation, and you try to make better decisions. So the reason... Uh, space technology is so important for, for, for sort of becoming available now to help everybody is that um, there are a huge number of satellites collecting imagery of the Earth every day, both from national programs, including, of course, the USGS NASA, uh, Land NASA Landsat program um, and the Copernicus program from the Europeans. Um, this is wonderful data, but the problem with it is... Um, you know, even that data is only sort of collected weekly. There's a whole lot of it. The real problem with it is there's so much of it that there's not enough human cartographers to take all those satellite pictures and turn them into maps. And it's not enough to just have a photograph from space. You need to turn it into a map so that you have quantitative information so you can answer real questions. For example, how much forest has gone away? How much surface water has changed? How large has the, has the city of Austin grown in the last couple of years? Right? And what did it displace? So the combination of satellite data plus artificial intelligence and automation in cloud has now opened up a new moment where we can produce a truly living map of the world. And that's, that's what we'll be talking about here today. But. 
And Alex, your team does a lot of that, right? So this is a perfect segue to you. Yeah, absolutely. So what our team is doing is trying to map how species are distributed around the world at a global level. And so we use satellite imagery, land cover maps, exactly what Steve was just talking about and Steve's team are producing to understand then how that change is affecting biodiversity and doing that on a species by species level. And so when you aggregate up that all those individual impacts at a global scale, begins, you can begin to understand the information a little bit easier, right? It becomes a little bit more manageable to start to focus on some of these priority areas of where we should begin to act. And so, you know, these uh, maps and, and videos available on the Half Earth Project map website are at the global scale, but you can really start to zoom in now and at very local conservation, you know, decision relevant scales. And, you know, you could look at a county and say, all right, well, if we're interested in developing a new park, should we put it here or should we put it here? And, and or alternatively, maybe um, where should we be redirecting potentially harmful human activities? And, you know, to kind of tie this back to climate change, um, it's, you know, I think we often forget that we're still very much reliant on the natural world and the services that properly functioning ecosystems provide to all of us. Things like clean air, clean water, um, food production, uh, disease mitigation, all these things really rely on diverse and functioning ecosystems. And uh, that's really important to ensure that we remain resilient towards climate change. Um, yeah, I yeah. love that. Yeah. It looks like we were having some tech difficulties, but we got it. And my favorite thing is just how beautiful these maps are, yeah. right? <laughs> They're stunning. So yeah, thank you so much for that work. All right, Sue. You're going to wrap it up. What are you working on now in relation to climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency? Sure. So um, I'm not starting with a map. I'm actually a, I'm an ecologist, so I'm happiest when my feet are on the ground and my hand is in this big mud pit. Um, but I, I study permafrost, and I, I want to show this image first because I do think when people think about the Arctic, you think about ice, and, um, and that's a really big part of it. But this is also a really big part of the Arctic, and this is this frozen ground. It's, uh, you know, underneath the ground and it is hard to directly see using a map, but it's really important because this ground, this frozen ground stores a lot of ice. When the ice melts, it collapses, you get something like this. And it also stores a lot of carbon and this is why it's really important globally. Um, and so this permafrost region shown here in blue is um, Arctic is warming faster than anywhere on the planet. The air is warming. The ground is starting to thaw, and that blue area you see is being reduced like this quite a bit. And so this is, you know, we may lose 75% of the permafrost region if we continue on our current climate trajectory. So a lot of the work that I'm doing is looking at, you know, what actions can we take to, we don't want the map to look like this, right? Like we want it, we want, we want the map that we saw previously. Um, for folks who are living in the Arctic, there's, you know, more than 4 million people who live on permafrost. This is really important. You can go to the next one. This is really important because if your home is like this and you're living really, really close to sea level, um, your only way in and out of your community, say, is by this runway. If that ground sinks a centimeter, two centimeters, that's really important. And so we need these maps to understand where the land is changing and what it's going to look like. And then for the rest of us on the planet who aren't living on permafrost, this is also really important um, because of the carbon that's stored in the ground. And you don't not even to worry about the numbers so much here, but just to say that, you know, there's so much carbon that's been built up in permafrost. It's frozen right now, but as it thaws, that carbon can be released as greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and methane. Um, the amount that may come out may be as large as or larger than emissions from the United States by the end of this century. And so there is a lot that the science, we need to learn. Uh, we need these maps so that we can learn it, but we do know that this is a really important source of carbon. And so that's really the sort of the two areas that I'm working on now. I just love your passion. I can see like at the edge of your seat, like so excited to talk to the audience. Um, so you didn't start with maps. So let's kind of go back a little bit. <laughs> How are GIS and imagery technology being used in the real world for your real work? Yeah, so um, so this is, um, so one of the things we're doing is, you know, I, I work a lot with people who live on permafrost and who are observing these changes firsthand. Um, and so this, this map here, this is showing this storm that happened this past year, a Typhoon Murbach that hit the um, uh, western part of Alaska. Um, and it really brought to our attention just 
uh, limited knowledge that we have on the ground in terms of like sensing and then also challenges of getting maps of the Arctic because it's always cloudy and it's dark half the year. And so one thing that we're doing is we're using this um, an app where people are doing surveys on the ground to document the changes that are happening. Because in some cases, this is the only information that we have. Um, so this is a survey one, two, three app. The other thing that we're doing, and you can go to the next one, is bringing satellite imagery to folks who are living on the ground to detect rates of change. So Digitus, we're partnering with 10 um, Alaska Native communities um, who have a very good sense, um, much better sense than I do as a Western scientist of the changes that are happening. Um, but one of the the things the community has expressed is they really need um, some of these mapping tools and environmental monitoring to assess rates of change. This is really important for decision making about adaptation. And you can see from this picture, this is one of the things that happens when permafrost thaws. You see these circled areas. These are lakes that drained. And these are two images over a 10 year period, but those actually drained like within a year, like in one. So they think of this permafrost as like a crack in a swimming pool and it drains out. And so this is other thing is just making imagery of available for people who are experiencing these changes. Um, and you can go to the next one. Um, yeah, and as I said, like this imagery is really important for making decisions. Some of the communities that we're working with um, are having to make decisions, say perhaps having to move homes away from a river that's eroding. And then in some cases, there's a really difficult decisions that communities are having to make to relocate their entire community. That is not a decision that anybody would wanna make and anybody makes lightly. So having all of the tools available, the technical tools, the indigenous knowledge um, to help in that decision making is, is really a critical part of uh, the work that we do. I can't help but just kind of peek over my shoulder every time. I love all of this. All right, Alex, how is your foundation, how is the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation uh, working with GIS and imagery technology? Yeah, absolutely. And so first I just want to echo the the incredible importance of getting this technology into, into local people, exactly what Sue's um, talking about. That's, that's so important. Even though we're working on these global initiatives, these large-scale things, it, it's only possible with, with on-the-ground um, community experts providing that information and us giving them that technology. And so kind of the real-world impact and things we're working on right now is so a few months ago, um, there was nearly 200 countries that came to an agreement and uh, formed the Global Biodiversity Framework. And so this was at COP15, so similar to COP27, the big climate conference, we have a nature one um, that's just, just focused on, on biodiversity and nature. And so that, that happened a couple months after COP27. And one of the targets that was agreed upon there was um, that we would conserve 30% of the Earth's land and water by 2030. And so this is commonly called the 30 by 30 initiative, right? It's very, very ambitious. Um, and so currently, globally, we're at about 17% land protected, 10% marine areas. So a doubling and tripling of, of where we need to go. Um, and it's really important that we aren't just hitting these targets as a percentage goal, as an area goal. It's just put conservation efforts anywhere to hit these policy um, very ambitious initiatives, and that um, we're using science to ensure that we're directing the activities in places that need it the most. And so our team at the, at the Wilson Biodiversity Foundation in Yale, we've developed a suite of indicators that track how species habitat and protection is changing over time. Um, basically, so we can give a rating um, to any area on earth of how important that is for biodiversity and that can uh, is, is extremely important to, to give that then to, to governments and to um, and companies to help them guide and report on their actions. And, and again, tying this back to, to climate change here, and especially carbon, especially what Sue was just talking about. Um, you know, we have COP27 goals, we have COP15 goals. They're both so important and, and ambitious, and it's really important that we can overlap those two and find areas where we can deliver co-benefits. So. With satellite imagery, we can map where the most important places are for carbon and then overlay that with the areas that are most important for biodiversity and help us achieve both of these um, extremely ambitious but important goals. So important. And Steve, how about Impact Observatory? How is Impact Observatory using imagery and GIS in the real world? So you've heard this now, and, and Sue made the key point that um, you need to be able to show people how things are changing in essentially in near real time. Because I think 
uh, world governments assumed that they could go slow, take plenty of time, be deliberative, maybe hope that the scientists were wrong even. Um, and things are changing pretty quickly and things may be accelerating and there's definitely areas where things are accelerating. And um, as Alex mentioned, there are some really nice indicators recommended by the scientific community on how to track climate and biodiversity and sustainability, which are the three big Rio conventions, UN conventions. Um, but you cannot make those maps quickly enough and get them out to people who need it if you're not using automation. And the key to automation now is that over the last, well, we, we started developing this technology actually 20 years ago in the US national labs. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've started to bring it to market um, for fancy countries and fancy companies 10 years ago with my previous venture back startup Descartes Labs. Um, but uh, now the, the thing that Impact Observatory is doing is that we are democratizing this technology. The type of AI that can take satellite observations from either national public data or from commercial satellites. And you can see an example of tracking um, sort of deforestation on the north, uh, one of the north edge of one of the big islands in the sort of Indonesian archipelago. Um, you can now produce these things and track changes happening in near real time across the entire constellation of constellations of public and satellite systems. Um, and so Impact Observatory, we are content providers. Um, we work with, closely with Esri because Esri is one of the major vendors of cartography software. It's the world's leading vendor of cartography software to governments and industry. Um, but you can have the map making tools. Unless you have the content, you can't get the, to the decisions that people need. Um, and, and so it's fundamental to be able to produce this type of data that people need. And if you can produce it to people in the right way, we can avoid something that I think we're all worried about, which is the, the, the risk of greenwashing, of people claiming that they're trying to do the right thing, but if nobody watches, if there's no agreed upon independent way to verify that changes are real and that impacts what impacts people are actually having, then there's a real risk of greenwashing. And what we want to do is we want to use this type of AI plus space technology through maps, through geospatial data, to move the whole community forward to a point where we can achieve something that I want to, the concept is provably green as the opposite of greenwashing. How can people's actions be provably green? And how can that information be shared so that the regulators, the actors in industry, the folks in markets and finance who are funding different people, and consumers who are consuming brands? How can we all know that we, through our individual actions we're contributing to outcomes that are provably green? And just as a plug, Impact Observatory recently submitted a new map, right? Published a new oh. map? Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you, oh, Sharon. yeah. 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 Um, so Impact Observatory, um, you know, uh, an independent scientific peer-reviewed study shows that we currently have the world's most accurate map of the world. And with the help of, of a number of our partners, including Esri, we have released as a digital public good the world's first time series of annual global maps so that this type of data that was previously only available to the U.S. and then to the world's richest companies is now available to every country. And uh, these digital public good annual maps are available through Esri Living Atlas, through Microsoft Planetary Computer, through AWS Registry of Open Data, and also through the UN Biodiversity Lab that uh, my team uh, worked with the UN Environment Program and UN Development Program to build and, and operate. So um, there's really good data now. Think of, think of like what happened with cell phones where all countries all around the world skipped generations of landline technology and went straight to smartphones, there's a similar opportunity now for every country to have data that's very similar to the very expensive data that the U.S. has made for itself over the last 20 years. Not just the fancy countries. Not just, not just, not the, just the fancy, the fancy countries. <laughs> so what's next? Sue, what does, excuse me, what does the future hold for the work in understanding climate impacts? So I think to follow up on this sort of the importance of AI and having the information come out faster, um, yeah, as you know, the climate is 
the climate is changing faster than we normally or traditionally have done science. And so that makes getting this information out there and, and making this information so that we can interpret it and understand it and apply it happen faster, even more important. And so we think about the global impacts of permafrost thaw, this sort of carbon emissions that are coming out. One of the things that we're working on is using artificial intelligence and using satellite data to be able to map these changes Changes, these big ground collapses, which, you know, it's, you know, 100 meters, say, on either side, which sounds pretty big, but when you think of the scale of the Arctic, it's like needle in the haystack. And so being able to track these, to map these for the first time and understand the carbon consequences is a really big part of the work that we're doing in trying to make this happen faster than um, it has been happening. And then I think the other part, if we go from, you know, that's the pan-Arctic scale, if we think about at a much more um, local spatial scale is using satellite imagery and really high resolution satellite imagery is to kind of do this same thing, look at where is the ground collapsing because of permafrost thaw, and we need to do this at a scale of like a home, of, of a runway, or, you know, of a community. And so getting this information out there um, and making it accessible to folks who are, who are making the decision so that we have uh, much more just and equitable decision making around climate change. What about you, Alex? What do you think is next? Yeah, so I'm going to echo both of what Sue and Sue just said, and, and hit on what I'm hopeful for is, is new systems to create better accountability and accessibility. So this is also true in the biodiversity space. And so, you know, operating at a global scale, but relevant to local scales, you need information that's specific, it's accurate, um, it's, it's understandable, it's accessible. You don't need a bunch of science degrees to know where you should act next. And I think that's really important. And so, um, you know, these things, Climate change and biodiversity are, are tricky. Are tricky things. Um, they're complex. They're complicated. And ensuring that we are delivering these products in an open and accessible infrastructure that allows for local people to be able to readily use them without crazy fancy supercomputers and to then submit and contribute their own local knowledge is is really really important. And we were talking about this before the panel started. How during the pandemic, eBird was huge, right? Because it was accessible and it was easy and people could just go out there and use it. And that's, that's the idea for this in the future. All right, Steve, what do you think is next? Yeah, and uh, I think, okay. So uh, the, the thing to think about is when the world has these types of maps and you can see changes happening on a near daily basis, right? Um, it's one thing to see it from above. Um, there's, there's still questions about how can you verify, if you see a change, how can you verify that it's real? And so we've started from the view from space, but part of what's next is to fold in all the information that you can get from, well, the, the expression that's sometimes used is from mud to space. Um, from all the way down to the folks on the ground, the scientists, like Sue said, who, who seem to enjoy getting dirty, and to the folks who are um, citizen scientists who are just observing things that are passing through their backyard. I remember the first time we had a series of un very unusually warm summers in my hometown of Melbourne, Australia, and uh, at my parents' house, and we started to get um, flying foxes coming to raid the citrus trees that hadn't been there before, but now all of a sudden there were <laughs> large bats flying around the backyard. <laughs> So when you see unusual stuff like that, as the saying goes, if you see something, say something, systems like eBird, like iNaturalist, allow everybody to be able to start to make observations that feed into the, to the, to the, the network of, of, uh, of observations. And, and when you think about it, when you conclude the humans, all of us being able to use smartphones to make observations, record them with GPS coordinates and timestamps, when you include that, with the ability to observe from above and feed all that information into the decision systems that allow countries to change their ideas as they go, right? To really have feedback into decision making, then you're talking about something that becomes a central nervous system for the planet, okay? For the first time, we can actually sense what's going on all around the world and not just where the humans are, but also what's happening to vegetation and species. 
and this becomes like a central nervous system. This is sensory information coming in, which can hopefully lead to better decision making. Yeah, we're at this. Oh, question. I'm really sorry. No. To interrupt. Um, did you say e-bird, like e-reader, but bird? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm. This is great. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the big takeaway points, Steve? Like, what are the things that you want our audience to leave with? Yeah. So. <sighs> If there are two things that I'd like you to, to, to leave with. One is that just in the nick of time, really, because these decisions need to be made now, um, artificial intelligence technology, the same sort of stuff that's, that's going into fun applications like ChatGPT, also have a very serious real world application, which is taking satellite imagery from all the world's constellations and turning it into these continuously updated living maps of the world. This is now possible now, thanks to decades of innovation in computers and in artificial intelligence and in space observations and launch. Um, so that's one big one now. We can make a living map of the world, finally. Um, the other one is that with this type of information that's equitably available to everybody, democratized, that we can have a situation where no one group has a monopoly on claiming what is the impact of their action. That governments, the industry actors, and consumers who are purchasing stuff from those governments and, and, um, and brands can all keep an eye on each other. And there's a really key role for media here too, that they now have access to information that can be used to keep an eye on everybody else. Um, hopefully not in a creepy sense, but just in a circle, mutual circle of accountability um, that, uh, that, that is going to accelerate the ability of, of decision makers at every level and in, in every country to get access to the sort of information that was previously siloed with only, as we said before, the fanciest folks. Yeah, I love this idea of just being able to see everything in real time. That's so huge. It's big for disaster response. It's big for climate change, right? There's so many things that we can apply this to. Alex, what do you think is next? Yeah, so I'm going to maybe move it away from, from maps and my takeaway messages oh, are, are going to be <laughs> just to remain curious. Be a curious person. And no matter where you live, you live in a big city, you live in a rural area, like living things are all around you. And to just like take a moment and, and appreciate those things and then be aware of your surroundings. Um, I, I, think, I think that's... Yeah, really, really important and can help us kind of like recenter ourselves and, and, and think about these, these larger things. Um, and, and then secondly, um, it's so easy to get involved. So we talked about eBird, we talked about iNaturalist. These are just apps you can download on your phone. You can become a citizen scientist like today. You don't need any background. Like we have experts who validate and review these things. So you can just take pictures of things that you see around you every day. It's gonna make you be more aware of your surroundings. You're gonna learn things about the animals and, and insects that are around you. But we actually use that data. So that gets um, expert reviewed and validated. It gets sent to our databases and that will actually inform these global maps that you see. And you know, with advances from Esri and, and maps like, like Steve are producing, we're getting to a point where we're no longer limited with satellite imagery, and actually what we're most limited in is point observations of, of the environment around us. And so your contribution to that is actually what we need most, and that crowdsourced format of that is the only way to do this um, at scale. And so, yeah. Um, I'd, yeah I'd, it, that's really Please cool. Do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're pushing the boundary of technology too, so we can take these images and really merge, merge them together. So, with the combination of satellite plus you all, hopefully you get out there and take some pictures, even today, right? Yeah. That would be so helpful. Sue, what do you think is next? Um, yeah. So I, 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 I all, yeah, I want to reiterate the importance of like staying curious and um, stop thinking of ourselves as separate from nature, right? Like hum we, are, we are nature, we are a species, we are one of many species. And I think when we start, stop thinking that way of us as a separate entity, um, I think it'll make it sort of the decisions we make a little bit more obvious and more sustainable. And then also just wanna really think about the importance, the importance of data. I'm a scientist who works a lot with a lot of data, but the, also the importance of 
um, all of us and sort of interpreting that data and our observations and the observations of the indigenous knowledge holders that I work with because we really, we need this data, but we also need the wisdom. And both of these together really, um, I think are key to sort of sound decision making. Yeah, totally. Those are our big three questions. And I'm so glad you actually pulled up a question in the mid-session because we really want to open it up to you all now. So we had those three big questions to start the conversation, and now it's up to you. What do you want to learn about? What do you want to hear? What do you, what do you want to talk to the panelists about? I saw your hand immediately. I saw one, two, three, so let's start here. All right. Yeah, there's a line of microphone. It's a microphone right here, so you can line up. <laughs> but we want to record you. <laughs> I can reiterate the question too. It's all right. I'm brave. Yes, Here we, go. we love it. Be brave. <laughs> um, so I work for a nonprofit that is sort of in startup phase. We've been developing for about a year now, um, creating an open source app um, to basically bring like data collection, mapping, and storytelling tools to communities who are low resourced, um, often indigenous. So everything you guys have said has been really interesting to me. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in are the challenges in doing this. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the challenges that you see um, as being potential obstacles that we should think through as well. Thank you. Oh, and my name's Amaya. <laughs> Lovely to meet you. Um, so before I pass it off to the panelists, I'll let them think for a minute, but I also want to tell you that Esri has some amazing open source options, so I would urge you to check those out. I think they could really help your nonprofit. <laughs> yes, for sure. I have lots of business cards if anyone wants to connect after, both um, physical and eco-friendly. So. I'll go. Yeah, yeah okay. please. So we actually use for the for the app this questionnaire that we use. We use Survey One Two Three, which is um, from Esri. And so, in terms of the challenges, so having that and having that like as a resource is really useful for us. And for us, um, the communities that are collecting the data, all of the data belong to them. And so this was a really nice way that the communities can be collecting it. Um, if they choose to share it with us, which they do, we see it, they access it, they then can choose how to use it, and we are working with them. Um, some of the challenges for us are just that I'm working with com some of the communities in the North actually have really challenging um, access to internet. Like they just don't have the bandwidth that we take, you know, for granted here. And so that is a big challenge. And, you know, it, you know, so having a very, very, very high resolution map, you know, that may be a beautiful thing that we can access and see all these changes here. It's just not possible. I often am taking a screenshot and then emailing it or sending a USB drive sometimes. And so, so that is one challenge that continues. Um, and then I think the other thing is not necessarily a challenge, but really an opportunity of just, um, me as a scientist being, uh, making sure that I take the time to really like learn from the communities, let the communities drive this because that's where the knowledge is and that's where the need is. And so in some ways I'm kind of just like a facilitator and carrying around this technology, um, and sharing it out as best as I can, but really making sure that I have the time and the space to allow that to happen. Thank you. And I'm not being rude, I'm taking up the <laughs> We love it. I'd also add for any folks out there that are similar similar to, to this question, um, I think having access to first class, recent, publicly available, broadly licensed and licensable content is super helpful to, you know, to be the basis of um, the location information that you're trying to collect with your app. So um, imagine being able to help direct people as to where they should get the next observation. Because you actually have maps that are updated frequently enough and that are publicly available so that you can help guide where people should do follow-up observations. So you don't have, um, you know, the extreme case would be a thousand people counting squirrels in Central Park in New York City and nobody going to the places where the real changes are happening, okay? Um, so I, I'm very happy to say that um, the, the, the wealth of science data that's now available through all the public cloud services, each of the clouds has really good libraries of open scientific data. Um, and some of them make the data very easy to download because they're using open source, open standard ways of sharing geospatial data. 
in particular. And so there's this thing, if people have heard the expression stack and cog, stack and cog is the sort of new open source way for geo sharing geospatial data. It's compatible as input for all the different proprietary systems. So it can be easily read in ESRI if you're, if you're uh, as many folks are ESRI users. But it's also an open standard for sharing stuff. And, um, and so the Microsoft Planetary Computer and the AWS folks have been really good about promoting these open standards for sharing the best content. Thank you. Yeah, I, can, I can add maybe just a little yeah. snippet because both of what Sue and Steve said are, are dead on in, in my world too. Um, and that this iterative cycle of once the information is collected, being able to process that even in small steps and then feed new information back to those users I think is really important. So directing um, additional data observation collection in places where you need it most is something that's really important. So we've developed indicators to do that globally, but then we are then focusing that local scales to build point. All right, if you're coming from this community, this is where we would really love you to go. And it also it's kind of fun, I think, for the user too, right? It's a, when you're given at least a little bit of instruction, it, it makes things a little bit more easy to, to begin with. Um, but also then working again with with indigenous communities or, or communities that don't have great access in, in very remote areas. So um, providing those options as well, but also the translation. So we work with like very formal taxonomies and those names of those species aren't what those people call them, right? And so being able to work with them um, and, and taking that time to basically fully update your database with these terms that you're not familiar with and making sure that that aligns then with our understanding and, and our ability to manage and store that data. Yeah, getting rid of all the scientific jargon. Exactly. Let's yeah. get rid of it. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is James Cloninger from uh, Motif, small business in the geospatial space in DC. Um, interesting, Steve. You made the, the squirrels in, in New York City. There is a map. I don't know if you, you probably know of it. So, <laughs> very cool one. Um, my question is more about governance, um, you know, and, and schema, basically. Uh, I've worked in, in some industries where the schema is really good and everybody knows what it is and you collect data and it's all great. Um, a couple of years ago, we tried to work with uh, Descartes Lab um, in collecting uh, poacher camps in African uh, parks and two problems. Like, we couldn't get imagery that was good enough to get close enough to, to use the, the tool. And, and the, the data was just all over the place. And it would take years to just filter through all that. So on a global scale, <clears throat> sorry, um, how do we get better at everybody you know, feeding into a system that we can all use? And I think that's partially what you were talking about. Yeah, so I can, I can uh, maybe start here, and then maybe Steve will actually have some solutions to your problem, hopefully. Um, but to say that, yeah, I think the poaching example is, is a great one. Um, and so, right, so we use the SMART system. And so this has been adopted by lots of large NGOs, uh, conservation NGOs. But you still see very many other organizations still using their own systems. Um, and unfortunately, our approach has just been to kind of adopt the, the largest one that has the most following just so that we can get the, the greatest breadth. Because we have so little time, um, you, we still have to just choose one and, and go with that. What we're still seeing is, I try not to think of it as competition among you know, environmentally focused or, or social environmentally you know, driven organizations to like fill the space and be the leader. It's every, there's a lot of people who care, right? And they all wanna make an impact and often uh, that drive and ambition and entrepreneurial spirit does come at conflict sometimes with everybody coming together to create a common you know, vision or path forward and, and working together. Um, I don't have an answer to that, but just to say that, that is, that's a major struggle that, that we see um, and um, hoping that after um, you know, COP15, COP27, these large international agreements where we have experts and panels who then begin to say, okay, we've reviewed all of them. This is the one that we're going to go with, and this is the one we're going to endorse. And so I think we need a little bit more of that, maybe not at the international level, but at national levels, subnational, um, for some sort of committee to come together and, 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 and say, all right, everybody, you've all developed amazing tools. This is what we're going to go with. Try to figure out how you can all support each other and, and work together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so a um, uh, couple of quick observations. And also, this is also an opportunity to also mention one of the potential downsides of democratizing the technology, which is that 
you know, Yale and, and uh, the other lady with the question about a new uh, sort of way of encouraging people to go out and do field observations. The positive side of that is, oh, I see some loss of habitat somewhere. I want to go count birds in that surrounding area and see if the bird count has changed because we have counts from before and now we're looking at afterwards. That's fine. The downside, though, that the gentleman mentioned with respect to poaching is that there are some biodiversity data that you need to keep very private. Um, and when I was at uh, National Geographic Society and, and uh, you know, it was a, we worked with some of the leading African conservation groups that are almost waging a war to try and preserve some of the last megafauna that are you know, national treasures of biodiversity. And to protect that, you have to be able to obscure the location of some data and um, while also making other data freely available. So, yes, schemas are super important. There are some good open standard organizations. I think the vector standard, I'll just be super technical for just for 30 seconds. The vector standards for object detection have not been worked out in the way that they have been on the raster data side. And so there's a real need to figure out how to do that. There's better satellite imagery now than there was even a few years ago. Um, and the new data is, avail is, is cheap enough that even NGOs like National Geographic Society can afford to get access to it um, under some of the programs that the different organizations provide. Um, but we need a common language for sharing detections. And, and those common standards need to include security pieces to the schemas so that scientists can share information in the field in a way that doesn't default to dumping everything to the web, to the open web. All right, there's a whole lot of folks that have questions, so maybe we should do it like, yeah, uh, like one off or for sure. shorter answers. I um, also just wanted to say, while there's a lot of publicly available data at 10 meters per pixel per se, Esri also partners with um, commercial partners uh, who have higher resolution satellite imagery that is not as easily accessible sometimes, but it can get you there. All right, okay, next question. So hi, I'm Liam. Uh, I work for the International Rescue Committee's Emergency Unit, and I work specifically on a project that delivers access to information for people in crisis, often who are fleeing. Um, so we have essentially, uh, the International Rescue Committee has done a, a number of different pilot projects using satellite imagery, uh, namely in Nigeria, looking into uh, how in changes in climate um, in satellite imagery can uh, be indicators for us to preact proactively dis distribute cash to farmers who might have harder time uh, receiving aid and then thus uh, allowing them to not have to flee as a result of the migration crisis. Um, and this type of a thing is very much a one-off um, so my question to you is, as a resource-limited institution, even though a very big international aid organization, and myself as a technology team that's dedicated towards giving people access to information as well as digital cash distribution, I'm curious how you, how you see um, that type of an institution being able to apply that. Like, where should, where should you start from an infrastructure perspective to be able to connect the insights that are being created uh, um, through artificial intelligence and other ways and applying it to um, humanitarian action. So, okay, so love to chat with you afterwards on this. I've actually worked on this sort of, uh, so I, I personally worked on damage assessment after a number of major disasters, including analyzing the, um, people may remember the US after Hurricane Katrina, we actually flew uh, U-2 spy planes over the United States to collect aerial imagery to, uh, you know, like to study, to not to study, to be able to guide response units to go and help communities in distress. Um, I personally worked on a bunch of stuff like that, including that specific thing. Now, with the humanitarian crisis, yes, one of the things most guaranteed to get the attention of first world countries, governments, is when they get scared that climate change is actually causing large scale human migration, right? Now, from a science point of view, from an ethical point of view, we want to 
just intrinsically help those countries avoid these problems. There are some really good advances in just the last couple of years. A few years ago, my team and I, we built an early warning system to detect food security issues across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, that was a published study. And we showed that using satellite imagery and AI, you could essentially reduce the cost of continual monitoring by a factor of at least 100. And that starts to bring the technology to the point where every organization should be able to get access to that type of data and use it to be able to, to show, to, to shine a spotlight on problems and then able to help um, guide action. And Sue, this is right up your alley, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I would add, which is not like news to you, I'm sure, is that the, you can make some really bad decisions um, with good intentions that have really bad outcomes if the people who are at the heart of this are not involved in that decision making, right? And so, and so, like we we can see a lot, and we can see a lot of change. And we can use that to guide, but really, like the. The, the decisions have to come from the ground, right? Like the guidance has to come from the ground. And so you're kind of maybe using these satellite data and AI to sort of zoom you in a little bit, but then to really like hit that target, it's gotta come from the bottom up, so. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Hi, hello. I'm Marina, I'm Brazilian. I'm CEO of Future Carbon, that is the largest developer uh, on carbon credits project in Brazil. Most of our projects are in the Amazon. We have almost 30 huge projects there, uh, most on red projects on avoiding deforestation and is starting to do a little bit of reforestation. And my, my question is uh, if you have work in the Amazon and um, especially on how we use data to, to uh, avoid or um, uh, see the deforestation coming, and also, how do you think that all the work that you are doing is going to disrupt the carbon credits market or in VEHA? Because the way that we do the projects to submit and be certified is very analogic, <laughs> very little real time. So I'm curious to hear. Thank you. Shall I jump on this quickly? Yes, um, so yeah, no, that. That's great, and uh, I think one of those unintended consequences that I think uh, is, is unfortunately quite clearly happening across all of Amazonia, not just mm -hmm. in Brazil, but across all of Amazonia, mm -hmm. is that when the international community acted to protect the rainforest in the core part of the Amazon, mm -hmm. um, a lot of deforestation and development moved to the Cerrado and the Atlantic coast forests mm -hmm. that weren't technically part of the Amazon forest. Mm -hmm. And so those are the ones that have had sub substantial change in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think the RED program and the way that you actually try and measure the amount of carbon per hectare or per square kilometer in the forest, that is a very labor intensive process of sending people out to measure the width of the tree at, at chest height and all sorts of sort of old fashioned things that you have to do. But once you've done that, people can spend a lot of money doing those assessments and then they still need a way afterwards to say, oh, one year later, is it still there? Mm -hmm. One year after that, is it still there? Um, if you start to see change, how quickly can you alert the authorities so that they can go in and see, well, what's causing the change? Was it expected change or was there somebody doing something illegal? And um, so anyway, so there's a thing, there's, I think this technology, it is very hard to measure the amount of carbon from space. Mm -hmm. But it is quite straightforward to say, after I've assessed the amount of carbon, to track the changes that are happening to that. And I think that's the low hanging fruit. That's the obvious first things that can be done to try and support the programs that you're working on, which I applaud. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to add too that that's very much at the forefront of Esri's mind. I haven't been involved in one of those projects specifically, but I've heard this program come up in our space, mm -hmm. and I know that we are pushing towards that. Okay, so, great. yeah, I will grab your card. Too yes, later. please do. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shanti. I'm a writer for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I think you probably know us. We are actually launching a satellite uh, to measure. Congratulations. Yes. Uh, yeah, I methane. Wish I, yeah, methane sat. Methane sat. I'm just the writer. I wish I had more to do with it, but um, 
it's measuring methane pollution, which is a major cause of climate change. Um, but as a writer, I want to thank you all for being great communicators on this issue. I think it's, it's a great panel. Uh, my question is, do any of you have uh, an example of uh, how satellite data has actually triggered environmental action? Um, and if not yet, where do you think it might happen first? Uh, so I, I have an answer to that. Um, sorry, Sue, Alex, please Take it away. jump in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so actually, so back in the day when I used to be at Los Alamos National Laboratory, part of the US National Lab Complex, I actually developed technology, part of the technology that's now Impact Observatory was work that we did with the Environmental Protection Agency to help them develop technology to detect, to detect pollution. And so we showed how you could do things like detect um, all right, I'll, do, I'll say the less gross one first. The less gross one was lead pollution coming out of a factory going downstream and being able to find along the river where the pollution source was. Um, and then the, the more gross one was, there's no good, there's no happy way to say it, effluent pl plumes coming out of confined animal feed operations, which are like horrific mass, uh, mass production of pigs in this case, which pigs are a very intelligent animal. It's extremely sad to see that the way that pigs are farmed in the United States often. Um, so there is some really good technology. It's been confined mostly to academia and a few things. And one of the tricks, one of the, one of the opportunities that we now have is that too often academics get funded to come up with like a way to detect things like these effluent plumes, but there's no way to operationalize their detection methodology and turn it into something that folks can rely on. Take science and turn it to action. Science to action. And so um, Environmental Defense Fund, um, we also used to work with Defenders of Wildlife that are, happen to be across the street from Nat Geo, so there's no excuse if we don't work with them. Um, that, you know, these folks uh, are really, these are like, people who are more trained on the communications and legal side. And um, yeah, uh, there's great opportunities now to bring this tech to bear to help you. Yeah, and I could maybe jump on that as well to talk about the science to action piece. So using satellite technology, we can detect on an annual basis of how much habitat is being lost on a species by species level. So we know certain species really like certain types of vegetation or habitat. So we can track that. And, and so now we're working directly then with governments in West and Central Africa to then deliver these prioritization maps co-developed with them to identify then where their next national parks or, or protections are gonna go or, or um, giving rights back to indigenous groups to then uh, conserve and, and um, further work in these areas. So it's about creating that infrastructure though and those pipelines um, and, and there's still a lot of, of hand holding that has to happen there. Um, automation can, can get us really, really far, but then when you're working with local people to give them um, that ability then to, to kind of just take it for themselves, that's where we're trying to get to, is give them the package and then kind of step away and let them then drive those decisions. But, um, but that is happening right now, yeah. Yeah, and then just to follow up, a lot of the work that I've been privy to, at least, is in terms of disaster response. But I think that goes hand in hand with the environment, right? So in 2018, with the Woolsey Fire in California, that was a huge environmental problem for climate change. But it was also a disaster response issue, right? We had to get all of those people out of Malibu because it was really dangerous. So I think the way... In my personal opinion, I think the way to start looking at the environmental changes that are that are or can be triggered by satellite imagery is to start with those disaster responses, see how they're tied and linked, and go from there. That's just a off the cuff thinking though. That's great. Thank you all so much. I think we are almost at time. We this might be the last one, but if we're we're fast, we might be able to get two. Hi, uh, my name is Parker Coy. I'm from uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, I've been working in the remote sensing community for a little bit, working mostly on problems related to uh, EYR propagation within the atmosphere. Um, so I rely on a lot of these kind of um, you know, satellite imagery data sets. Um, so a trend that I've noticed at this conference and in the community more broadly are these kind of AI-derived climate data sets, uh, whether it be like Microsoft's Climax or, um, you know, NVIDIA's Earth 2. Um, but a big hesitation or, uh, well, yeah, a, a hesitation that I have in 
using these uh, data sets is maybe uh, my background's in physics and I feel like I can't sort of draw a straight line between these sort of, um, you know, physics-based equations that are used to derive these variables and the um, sort of outputs that I get back. Um, so could you talk a little bit about um, these sort of strengths and weaknesses about using AI drive data versus more traditional like reanalysis data sets or, you know, sort of physics, more, more physics-informed um, sort of approaches? If we take it quickly, we can get another question. But also, this is a... It didn't sound like a quick... A no, quick it did one. not at all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It oh, oh, okay. was a detailed let me, one. <laughs> let, yeah. let me just say this. Um, so, so, so my physic, my, my PhD is in, in theoretical physics. That's, that, was, that was my background um, before I started my journey into AI and Earth observation. So, yeah, there's some really interesting, um, uh, very large-scale AI-produced weather and climate models now. Um, actually, one of my colleagues at Descartes Labs... Uh, uh, Ryan Kiesler actually recently produced and published some of these leading um, models. Um, the, there's really interesting questions about how do you validate an AI system so that it's not just a black box. This is why it isn't so important to link it in with human observations underneath. Um, and, but it's also not fair to require the black box system to be somehow perfect when in fact all the other models are also pretty well much black boxes as well. So I, I think that's an interesting debate. There's going to be a lot more of this debate. And, uh, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing. I'm sure we'll have a chat. So it'll be interesting to hear like, how you're approaching that validation problem. Yeah, I guess I'd add one thing, like garbage in, garbage out, right? And it's the same thing with like any model. And so if the if the AI models are guided by knowledge and by human and are validated, then you can, they be really, really helpful for detecting patterns. And, you know, then you, then you have the human element that is sort of guiding that. And so quality in, quality out. Okay, we are at time. I'm so sorry, but please connect with us after. I want to say kind of on that note too, and I'm going to push it over. Um, Esri just signed a Space Act agreement with NASA to try to make that data more available. So in a different sense, like we want to validate those models, but also we want to make it as available as possible so people don't have to have that kind of background that you're thinking about and talking about. So um, just another example. So with that, please find us after. Please stay as long as you'd like. I would like to thank our amazing panelists. Thank you so much. We couldn't do this without you.